singer. A very warm welcome to both our on-site audience and to our virtual audience who are joining us from many cities around me, in addition to Calcutta and from many countries of the world on our YouTube live stream and also through the Facebook live stream organized by our friends at Anundo Publishers. Last 26th December, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak delivered the inaugural Krishna Bose lecture. And this year, we have the second Krishna Bose lecture to be delivered shortly by Nirupama Rao on the power of soft power. But before we move on to the second Krishna Bose lecture, we have a birthday present for Krishna Bose. She is 91 today. And it's a birthday present I rather suspect she would like. This is an omnibus anthology of over 100, 106 or 107 of her articles and essays, as well as three poems, published over her lifetime as a writer. From 1951, when she was first published in the Statesman newspaper, until the very last article of her life, which was published in Anandubajar Potrika in February of 2020. Krishna Boshu Probondho Shangraho Unishwakanno Theke Duhajar Kuri Prokash Kurechen Anandu Publishers. I had the idea of compiling this anthology, this collection of her articles and essays written over a period of 70 years, 1951 to 2020, very soon, a few weeks after her passing in February 2020. And when I first broached the idea to our friend Shubir Mitro of Anandu Publishers, he was immediately enthusiastic. Later, I worked a lot on the editing and production of this volume with another, uh, with another colleague from Anandu Publishers, Ratul Bandapadhyay. When I mentioned this volume in the making, exactly a year ago to Mr. Arup Sharkar, who also happens to be a member of the Council of Netaji Research Bureau, he too was very enthusiastic. The book was published three months ago, but it is being ceremonially released today on the occasion of Krishna Bose's 91st birth anniversary. Um, let me say a few words about the volume as its compiler and editor. Most of the articles included in this volume, a hundred plus, were written and published by her in Bengali, but there are a small number she published down the decades, including recently in English, which I edited, uh, which I translated into Bengali um, for inclusion in this volume. And these, this small number of English pieces appeared in the Statesman, the Illustrated Weekly of India, and the Indian Express, among other publications. Uh, there are also, as I mentioned, three poems included. Tinti uh, Kovita, which constitutes one of the seven sections in which this 550-page anthology is organized. 
Uh, my mother wrote poems very rarely, but I felt that the ones she did write should be included in this volume, and they are three beautiful uh, poems. Krishna Bose is perhaps known above all for as a trailblazing as a trailblazing writer on Netaji Shubhaschandra Bose's life, politics, and struggle, including the, of course, the Azad Hind movement and the Indian National Army. She is rightly known um, for being a pioneering researcher on Netaji um, and uh, someone who wrote uh, seminal books as well as articles on that topic. About one quarter of the 100 plus articles and essays in this volume are Netaji related but only about one quarter. Uh, the Netaji-related articles uh, include many of her classics, um, as well as perhaps slightly less known but very interesting penetrating articles she wrote in relatively recent years, the last 10 or so years in particular. Uh, indeed, the majority, probably more than half, of the articles and essays in this volume um, were written by Krishna Bose relatively late in life, in the last decade of her life, the last 10 or so years, including very many uh, when she entered a particularly prolific stage as a, a writer and a, a, a columnist in the last five or so years of her life from the ages of 85 to 89, 2016 to 2020. Um, there were two things that struck me when I was compiling and editing this volume for publication. Um, first, the stunning range of my mother's writings, which notably include, but go far beyond Netaji and his life and struggle. Um, the second thing that struck me was the quality of the writing consistently from the beginning to the end. From 1951 to 2020, two things. First of all, the substance, the, uh, the, the intellect at work on a very diverse range of topics and subjects. And second, the clarity of expression. She was, of course, well known for this. Um, I have written in the Bhumika, or the introduction to this volume, J. Bangla Bhashar Erokom Shotcho Shabulil Prayog Khub Komi Dakhajai. To reflect the stunning range of her writings, um, this volume is organized in seven sections, as I've already mentioned. Uh, you might think that, as her son, I am not the most objective evaluator of the quality of her work, and in a sense you may be right. Uh, Mama wrote in the acknowledgement section of one of her books, um, the, uh, An Outsider in Politics, uh, published in 20, 2008 and in paperback in 2015 in a revised and updated form, that I, Shumantru, uh, have always been her most severe critic uh, of her writing. And uh, uh, she, she writes that, well, um, I, I know she hasn't written this, that sometimes she would get slightly annoyed by my criticism but ultimately, she says she benefited from it. Um, there are essays and articles in this volume, starting from her first publication in The Statesman in 1951, her first Bengali article on modern art, published in the Bengali literary magazine Desh, 
in 1954 as a 23-year-old student. Um, I have my personal favorites from her early writings. Um, for example, uh, a wonderful review of a massive exhibition of Obanindranath Tagore's works, uh, which she published in The Statesman in 1955. She was an art and literary critic. Uh, I particularly like uh, what I believe to be a truly extraordinary essay, outstanding in its quality, on Toru Dutt, the writer, of the late 19th century. Then there's, of course, Proshongo Netaji, about Netaji, another section. Um, there's a lot else besides. Um, she writes about the, her memories of the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War. Uh, there are sketches of personalities she met and got to know, ranging from Indira Gandhi and Atal Bihari Vajpayee and APJ Abdul Kalam to Asma Jahangir and even J. J. Lalita. Some of her book reviews are included, reviews she wrote of books. <laughs> For example, an extremely erudite evaluation of Kipling's uh, writing, uh, but also, for example, uh, a review she wrote in Boer Desh less than 10 years ago of uh, the first novel by the Libyan author Hisham Matar, which she read uh, overnight sitting on the staircase of my London house um, exactly 10 or so years ago. Um, as you would know, Krishna Bose had a decade-long, fairly spectacular career as a politician and a parliamentarian. And after a decade, she decided to step back from party politics, a decision she never regretted or considered withdrawing. But, as I've written in this volume, from that time onwards until her passing about 14 years later in 2020, Ma Tar Shangshad Rajnitik Jibonir Arupto Obhigata Kromagoto Deshobashi Shange Bhagkure Nyechen Tar Lekhar Matome. In fact, the single largest section of this volume consists of her writings, mostly over the last ten years and many in the last five or so years, on the contemporary cultural social, economic, and political issues and problems of our state, West Bengal, and our country, India. Uh, they are informed by deep and mature wisdom. Um, so in this volume, you will have her outstanding writings written on the occasion of Tagore's 150th, Rabindranath Shange Barohe Otha, <laughs> you will have um, her, her article written on the occasion of Shami Bibekanondo's 150th in 2013, Nari, Jagunid, Nari Jagarunid Purodha, Shami Bibekanondo. So growing up with Rabindranath, Nari Jagarunid Purodha, Shami Bibekanondo is um, the pioneer of women's awakening, Shami Bibekanondo. But you also have, alongside them, beautiful articles written after the death in Delhi nine, nine years ago of Nirbhaya, and the death in Hyderabad five years ago of Rohit Vemula. Uh, I have written in this volume that uh, Ashi Uttirno, she is writing all these pieces when she is in her 80s, Jibonir Sheshparbe Pochono Ajun Manushir, Bortomane Shange e Shangjog, Haito Shoti Birol. The connection of someone in the last phase of their life, a woman in her 80s, with the present and what's going on in our city, our state, our country, and in the world at large, is perhaps truly rare. Um, so I hope that uh, many of you. Uh, will find the opportunity to uh, pick up this volume. 
I think it's available in our bookshop um, as well this evening. Uh, and they have informed me that they are offering a 20% uh, discount. But of course, you can buy it off the Arunda Publishers website as well as uh, many bookstores. So that's a snapshot, a glimpse of uh, Krishna Bose's birthday present on her 91st. Krishna Boshu Prabhantu Shangraho Unisho Akanno Teke Duhajar Kuri. Shottur Bachurer Lekhok Jibanir Poshul. Let me end by reading you two very short excerpts from the introduction to this volume that it fell on me to write as its editor and compiler. From the beginning, Krishna Bushu Jibanir Prothom Prabhunthuti Lekhin this is with apologies to those of you, especially, but not only in our large virtual audience, who don't understand Bengali or imperfectly understand Bengali. It's in Bengali. Krishna Boshu, Jibanid Prothom Probonthuti Lekhen, Barobachur Boyshe, Unishotetali Shale. Probonthe Shironam, Pothed Kukur, The Stray Dog, her first literary effort. Babamar Akmatru Shantan Krishna, Tokun Thakten Shat by Ak Dover Lene, Ekti Banglu Dhachir Barite, Obushu Tarpori Tinjo Nutejan, Akshu Nobboi C. Rashbihari Avenue, Chartorar Flatin. Dover Lene, Pashir Barir Bagane, Ekti Rastar Kukur, Chatti Chhana John Modai. Tar Ektike, Krishna Barite in a portion. Dithio Bishojut Teshomoy Dover Lene, Choloman military truck, Chapadai, Chotto Poshotike Krishna Tar Haranu Chikana Gronte, English Shangskoron, translated by me, Lost Addresses, a Memoir of India, 1934 to 1955, She Gronte Likachin, She Shokteke Amar Jibonid, Prothom Lekhar Jonmo Pothid Kukur. Namiak Lekha Likipellam. Shadin Teke, Archpojunto de Kiaschi, Gobhi Shok Baduke Shomoy, Shekota Likepelle, Monir Bhar Lakub Hejai. Swishtishil Lekhar Motede, Agtoroner Catharsis Hai. You can experience catharsis through creative writing. Potir Kukur Probontoti, Prokashito Hechilo. Krishna did Paribarik ba in house magazine Lekhone. A Lekhon Putrikati Rabir Bhab, Krishna Ruddoge. Mot Duti Shankabiri Echilo. Unisho Titalisha Sheshed Dike are Unisho Chualisher Prothom Dike. Krishna Nijer Bhaibo Nathakleo, only child. Cousins Chilo Prochur. Tadir Ebong Oshunko Kaka Kakima. Mama Mamida de Shahayotai, Lekhon Putrikar at the Prokash. Hate Lekhanai, Chapano Putrikar. Chotukaka, Binot Chonto Jodhuri, Tokun Bishop Haruti, Publishing Bibhage, Kachkotin. Jaki Amra, Pagladadu Bole, Daktam. Chotukaka, Binot Chonto Jodhuri, Kolkatar Gorango Press Teke, Putrikati, Chapi Edilin. She Teke, Duhajar Kurishaler February te Jibonir Shesh Din Porjonto Krishna Bushu Shudhu Likhe Gachin Amar Monehai, you know, she believed her most important identity and role in life to be that of her mother. But if she had to decide what was her second most important identity in life, she would choose her vocation as a writer and an author. She was a compulsive and prolific writer. This is her 20th volume that's being formally published today. And of course, hundreds of articles and essays, the most valuable of which have been gathered into this volume. Beshir Bhagi Likhechen Matri Bhasha Banglai, she mostly wrote in our mother tongue, Bengali, 
but she also wrote some books, a few books, and some articles and essays in English. <clears throat> There's one person I should mention today. Lekhika Krishtar Utsho O Onuprerona Tar Paribarik Aboho, her father, Charuchandra Choudhury, who lived from 1895 to 1987, our beloved Dadua. Charuchandra Choudhury Chilen Ak Bidan Bidogtho Manush. Bishai Ainoggo O Shongbidhan Bishishoggo Holeo, Bibitho Bishore, Tar Bipul Agroho Ebon Gobhid Gan, Knowledge. Chitrokola, Shongit, Shahitto, Shabiti. Tar Potipolon Amra Krishnabo Shurmote Dektepai. Her father influenced her formation deeply. Rashbihari Avenue Proshosto Flate, Desh Bideshir Boer Bipul Shambhar. That library is still in our house today, uh, our grandfather's personal library uh, of books from all over the world. Charu Chandro was a bibliophile in the real sense, a man of profound erudition and a cosmopolitan man of letters. Krishna Shabhapchilo Mukchora Chapa, Ingrijite Jakebole, private introverted. She was a shy person. In Harano Chikana or Lost Addresses, Krishna has written, Kishori Bosh Tiki, from her teenage years, she was a boyer poka, a bookworm. <laughs> Teenager Krishna, Dubet Hakten, Babar Bishal Shomritho Library. She Tiki, Lekhika Krishna Uttaron. <clears throat> now from the end, a uh, short excerpt from the end of my bhumika or introduction to this omnibus anthology of Mamma's articles and essays published over 70 years, 1951 to 2020. Mar Jiboni Shakti Chilo Tar Lekha. She got the Jiboni Shakti, um, kind of a reason to live and kind of an inspiration to live by writing. Onik Shumai Likten, Amadir Nobboi Sharut Boshu Roder, Boshundhara Griher, Boshundhara Namti Omad Dewa, Boshundhara Griher, Sheth Pathorer Dining Table. A Dimakriti Marble Table Tea, Aknom Borbari, Woodburn Park Theke, Boshundhara Ashe, Unishu Chuat To Shale. Akhuntar Boish, Ontoto Nobboi Hobby. কিন্তু অন্য কোথাও গেলেও মা না লিখে থাকতে পারতেন না 2008 সালে মার সঙ্গে মিশর ইজিপ্ট ভ্রমণ করেছিলাম উই ট্রাভেলড ইন ইজিপ্ট টুগেদার ভ্রমণের অঙ্গ ছিল নীল নদে নৌকা বিহার আ নাইল ক্রুজ फ्रॉम লাক্সর টু কায়রো ভ্রমণসঙ্গীরা ইট ওয়াজ আ গ্রুপ এক্সকারশন ভ্রমণসঙ্গীরা आवर ট্রাভেলিং কোম্পানিয়ানস Still remember, Ajo Mone de Kitchen, Amadir Cruise Boater Lobite, Ecti Table O Chair Dokul Kore, Krishnadi, Likhecholechen. Amad Londoner Barid Living Room, Akta Golakriti Kache Table Achin. Botcher Bor Botcher de Kitchi, Ma Shekane Bushe Likchen, Kokono Boy, Kokono Probondo. Amono Hueche. Dirko long haul flight, Mark Ati Dietchen, Liki. Obusho Shita Bati Krom, Karun Lomba flight, Ma cinema dekte Halavashtin. She liked watching movies on long haul flights rather than write. Ma Akash dekte Kub Halavashtin. Shoishobe, Tirishe Doshoke, nineteen thirties. Dovan Lidir Barir Chutto Bagane Boshe, Dadu Mane. Amadir Dadu, Charu Chandra Chaudhuri, Maake Tara Chinaten. Kichu Pare, Cholishe Dashake, Kishori Baishe, Shautal Porgonar Mihi Jamer, Bagan Barid, Prushosto Bagane Boshe, Dadu Arma, Ratir Akasher Tara Dekten. London e Rakash, Onekshumai Kub Shundur Hai, Bichitru Rupe, Bibhinno Ritute, Ar Din Ratir Bibhinno Shomai. 
আমার লন্ডনের বাড়ির চারদিক বেশ খোলা আর ছড়ানো তাই আকাশ ভালো করে দেখা যায় একতলা দোতলা তিনতলা থেকে ডিফারেন্ট ভিউজ ফ্রম ডিফারেন্ট ফ্লোর্স মার শোবার ঘর বেডরুম বাড়ির দোতলায় মা শুতে যাবার সময় আমি বাগান ঘেঁষা এক দেয়াল জোড়া জানলাগুলোর পর্দা টেনে দিতে যেতাম সকালের আলোয় যাতে মার ঘুম ভেঙে না যায় মা কিন্তু বারণ করতেন এমন কি লন্ডনে সেপ্টেম্বর টু নভেম্বর টোয়েন্টি শেষ সফরের সময়ও মা বারণ করতেন আর বলতেন আমি তো আকাশ দেখি মার অন্যতম প্রিয় চিত্রশিল্পী ইংরেজ আর্টিস্ট টার্নার পুরো নাম জোসেফ ম্যালড উইলিয়াম টার্নার লিভড ফ্রম সেভেন্টিন সেভেন্টি ফাইভ টু এইটিন ফিফটি ওয়ান খুব সুন্দর আকাশ আঁকতেন মাকে দেশে ফেরার ফ্লাইট ধরতে হিথ্রো এয়ারপোর্টে গাড়ি চালিয়ে নিয়ে যাচ্ছি বিভিন্ন গাঢ় রঙে রঞ্জিত আকাশ দেখে মা বললেন টার্নার্স স্কাই আমার একশো এক ফার্নেস রোডের বাড়ি থেকে লন্ডনের অপরূপ আকাশের ছবি তুলে মাকে পাঠিয়েছি ফেব্রুয়ারি দু হাজার কুড়িতেও আমার মনে হয় মার সাত দশকের লেখক জীবন হলো আকাশ দেখার নামান্তর দ্যাটস ইট নাও ক্যান আই ইনভাইট আওয়ার ফ্রেন্ড মিস্টার সুবীর মিত্র হু ইজ রিপ্রেজেন্টিং আনন্দ পাবলিশার্স হেয়ার টুডে টু জাস্ট কাম আপ ফর আ মোমেন্ট অ্যান্ড জয়েন সুগত অ্যান্ড মাই সেলফ অন দ্য ডায়েস ফর দ্য সেরিমোনিয়াল রিলিজ অফ দিস অ্যান্থোলজি Now, uh, can I to um, introduce Nirupama Rao, who will deliver the second Krishna Bose lecture. One afternoon in December 1999, Krishna Bose writes in An Outsider in Politics, we were about to order lunch at the Central Hall. For some reason, Shugato was with me. My other party colleagues, excepting Momota, were also there. Suddenly, we found Momota rushing in. She came towards me and said, give me your hand, and vigorously shook my hand. To the others, she declared, today's lunch will be on Krishnadi. Let us all congratulate her. My heart sank. I thought now she must have got me into the panel of chairmen who stand in for the speaker in the Lok Sabha. But no, she announced, I have just heard Krishnadi has been appointed the chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on External Affairs. Thus began my new responsibility in the 13th Lok Sabha. The Parliamentary Standing Committee system had been established as late as 1994. Krishna Bose's only predecessors as chairs of the Committee on External Affairs were Atal Bihari Vajpayee for four years and Inder Kumar Gujral for one year. I was taken to be a rather unconventional chairperson of the External Affairs Committee, she writes. 
I was determined to make the committee stronger in its role of overseeing the conduct of India's foreign policy. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee was my model, even though I did not succeed in making my committee as powerful as its American counterparts. A few pages later, my mother writes about Chokila Ayer, then Foreign Secretary, and Nirupama Rao, then spokesperson of the MEA. I had an excellent rapport with these two women who came frequently to testify before the committee. Nirupama Rao rose to become our High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, Ambassador to China and the United States, and Foreign Secretary. I have enjoyed the warmth of her hospitality along with my mother in cities as far apart as Colombo and Washington. Earlier this year, she has published a path-breaking book, The Fractured Himalaya, India, Tibet, China, 1949 to 1962, which is thoroughly researched, elegantly written, and remarkably balanced in its interpretation. As soon as our invitation to this evening's event went out, I received letters from all over the world saying what an apt choice she was to deliver the second Krishna Bose lecture. For example, Gopal Krishna Gandhi wrote from Chennai, I'm grateful for the invitation to the event planned around the late Srimati Krishna Bose's 91st birthday. The program brings with it the fragrance of her grace the strength of her mind, the veracity of her intellectual energies. I am delighted that the scholar diplomat, Srimati Nirupama Rao, is to give the memorial lecture standing in Krishnadi's name this year. Few things could be more appropriate, for Srimati Rao epitomizes the respect for facts and the sanctity of honest intentions, frankly and courteously expressed that must mark the highest diplomatic method, something that Krishnadi tried to safeguard as a member of parliament with a vital interest in foreign policy. We had planned to welcome Nirupama to Calcutta in person. In view of the deteriorating public health situation and to avoid the risk associated with travel from Karnataka, she will deliver her address from Bangalore. May I now invite Nirupama Rao. Krishna Bose's was the examined life, always balanced in joy and stoic in sorrow, to use her words, imbued with the best of human values, courage, empathy, compassion, and scholarship rising above the narrow confines of party affiliations in politics and steadfast in its focus on the broader national interest. Her impressive memoir, An Outsider in Politics, which I have been reading, is a beautiful recounting of her fascinating life, for she was witness to, and often a player in, some epic and momentous events in independent India's history. Having known Krishna Bose since 2001, when I was spokesperson of the External Affairs Ministry, and she, as member of the Lok Sabha, was chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee for External Affairs, I consider it an honor and privilege to be in your midst today to speak on a topic that she would have considered most relevant and crucial for our time. The subject of soft power, I believe, would have appealed to her tremendously, as she was one who both instinctively and intellectually grasped the meaning of this concept with unerring precision, knowing its worth and capacity to influence outcomes in a manner that enables the greater composite good. As a lifelong Democrat who embraced pluralism and diversity, she also understood 
the effectiveness of soft power and that it is directly enhanced by the maturity and the vision of the democracies who wield it as if they were two sides of the same coin. Power through human history has conventionally been defined as the strength of the militarily mighty and hegemonic rather than the quiet, subtle magnetism of civilizational strength, cultural appeal and the ability to influence outcomes through persuasion, attraction and example without coercion or intimidation. Hard power is the default, soft power is elusive and the Cinderella in the story. As humans, we have had to deal with legacies of war left behind by the exercise of raw power rather than those of peace. We see the desolation of battlefields and the sacrifice of the fallen, dreadful, despicable outcomes. The geopolitical default for most of us, therefore, has been to bleed in war rather than sweat in peace. At the same time, it is argued that hard power is the bedrock from which soft power draws its effectiveness, durability and reach, and that without hard power, soft power has little sway, strength or viability. The currency of hard power still dominates the world of international relations, therefore. The use of military force and economic sanctions are go-to tools favoured by the dominant global powers as a means to achieve desired ends. Whatever the validity of the last argument, it should still not take away from the need for countries such as ours to consciously develop and better deploy the portfolio of our soft power assets so that they substantively enhance the nation's stature in the world and in international public opinion, furthering our long-term strategic aims and interests. The dominance of hard power does not diminish the relevance and need to use non-military assets to realize national goals on the global stage. The old Hindi saying sums it all up. Jaha kaam aaye sui, kaha kare talwari. If a needle suffices, why use a sword? Three decades ago, the Harvard University professor Joseph Nye defined soft power as the ability to obtain preferred outcomes through attraction rather than coercion. Its major characteristics, as Nye outlined, were culture, when it is pleasing to others, values, when they are attractive and consistently practiced, and policies, when they are seen as inclusive and legitimate where you moved from exporting fear to inspiring optimism and hope. To cite an example, Mahatma Gandhi was the quintessential exponent of benign yet potent soft power through his moral efficacy and the use of the inclusive and legitimate values of nonviolence to set the agenda of Indian independence and to inspire future struggles against injustice and domination the world over. Soft power thus encapsulates the smart and strategically positioned use of communication, of visual media and the spoken word by personalities, whether from politics, science, business, literature, sports, media and the performing arts who can shape the discourse concerning their country favorably. It is in essence discourse power, a means to become what in modern terminology is a standout 
influencer of opinion in favor of your country, organization, or group through the employing of persuasion and the force of attraction and without the use of intimidation or coercion. That discourse power for India must be tied to the strength of governance, constitutional values, openness, sensitivity and transparency in dealing with minorities and the disadvantaged, the protection of human rights, the attraction of entertainment, style and fashion, the high standards of universities and education, tourism and heritage conservation, and environmental protection. The richness of India's soft power reserves is not to be disputed. We accept it as a given. We remember Mark Twain's words about the fascination that people abroad have had for India through the ages as a cradle of the human race, the mother of history, grandmother of legend, great-grandmother of tradition. This mystique is something that our leaders and foreign policy spokesmen have long sought to purvey, linking it to a modern context to create images of India as a crucible of humanity, a repository of spiritual and wellness traditions and practice, a mosaic of many races and religions, identifying with universal values that speak of the world as one family. In fact, the very word yoga in Sanskrit means to join or to unite so that India's projection of the benefits of yoga to the world also conveys that underlying message of a unity of body and soul in the human consciousness seeking to fulfill in its own way the age-old quest for universal concord and harmony. Let us recall Sri Aurobindo, who in a radio message on 15th August 1947, which also happened to be his birthday, spoke of five dreams for India. One of those was for India to play a prominent part in ensuring a unification of the human world, read robust multilateralism, and developing that larger statesmanship of cultivating that international spirit and outlook where nationalism would have lost its militancy and a new spirit of oneness would take hold of the human race. This recalls Tagore's motto for Vishwa Bharati, Yatra Vishwam Bhavati Ekanidam, where the world makes a home in a single nest where interconnectedness replaces narrow nationalisms. Drawing inspiration from Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, our soft power is also meant to draw strength from the unity of this land and the gospel of harmony, as Netaji termed it, of all religions, of cultural synthesis, and that respect for freedom that is the song of the liberated, emancipated soul, which was the message of Swami Vivekananda. Tagore, another passionate votary of India's rich diversity and pluralism, saw India's strength as stemming from her capacity for civilizational dialogue of creating the empires of the mind and Advaita of humanity. His desire was the preservation of that moral force which he saw as giving quality to our civilization and making it worthy of being honored. However, soft power based on the rich civilizational ethos of India and Indian culture does not come cheaply and it can work as an aggregator for the national interest only if it is accompanied by the evidence of real developmental progress on the ground of the radical transformation of Indian lives for the better 
of the elimination of poverty, squalor and destitution, illiteracy and the marginalization of women, especially in the rural areas, and ensuring inter-religious harmony and improvements to infrastructure. We can ill afford to assume a self-serving or delusional stance on the soft power strengths we visualize ourselves as possessing in overflowing abundance when there is so much work to be done at home to improve lives. Even the excellent work we have done in vaccine diplomacy, which is a facet of soft power, is impacted adversely when the world sees the toll that the Delta variant of COVID-19 took on our population during the unutterably tragic days of May and June this year because our health infrastructure and oxygen availability were overwhelmed by this tidal wave of the virus. Today, if we see our image in a giant reflecting pool filled with impressionist pictures of a glorious past, which is fast forwarding India into a future imagined as even more glorious, we may be losing the plot. There is need for some introspection here. Soft power should have its roots in our present day strengths and demonstrated achievement embedded in inclusive societal values, economic growth, comprehensive national development, and democratic beliefs that are products of a millennial heritage. At the same time, it must be in tune with the times. It must speak to the 21st century in a voice that belongs to these times. At the risk of repeating myself, we could score much higher on the Global Soft Power Index if our universities were recognized as world-class institutions of learning, if our cities were clean and better planned, if gender-related violence diminished, if poverty declined rapidly, and population growth curtails itself, and we continue to foster diversity and pluralism as an article of national faith more than any religion. Years ago, a friend, the late Sumantra Ghoshal, spoke of what he called, for organizations and companies, the smell of the place. The smell of a place, he would say, is what you size up in five minutes of entering it, whether it is constrained by the dreary desert sands of habit or whether it emphasizes aspiration and legitimate ambition self-discipline, ease of doing business, modernity, efficient state capacity, a whiff of exhilaration, ample doses of mutual trust and energy. The smell of a place is determined by the context rather than the people who populate it. It is the context in which we function as a society and a country. It is the smell of the place that the outsider gauges when he enters the country and determines the extent of your attractiveness and soft power. There are those who claim that the recognition of Indian soft power globally is a recent phenomenon attributable entirely to efforts made by Indian policymakers over the last few years. Let us remember that poets and philosophers, theater personalities and educators from abroad have been inspired by India's civilizational aura and ethos for centuries now. I remember the Hollywood star Gregory Peck reciting Tagore's beautiful poem unending love at the funeral of Audrey Hepburn. Those moving words, clad in the light of a pole star, piercing the darkness of time, you become an image of what is remembered forever. These words have a power of persuasion that resonates across time and space. 
four centuries, people have searched for their imagined India, the place of every arrival, as the English poet Kathleen Rain said, braving deserts and mountains and overcoming the most challenging obstacles. That was the drawing power of this wondrous land, this land of India, as Rimsky-Korsakov's famous aria, The Song of India, from the opera Sadko put it, and it is not a recent phenomenon. Let us also caution ourselves that the usage of terms like Greater India, meaning the cultural sphere of Indian influence in Asia, was consciously given up by India after independence. So, when one TV anchor recently structured an entirely vacuous discussion around this theme of Greater India, as he pointed to a map stretching from Afghanistan to Cambodia, one could not help but feel that such a lack of both emotional and intellectual quotient will never win us friends in our neighborhood. It is for those beyond our borders to willingly acknowledge the influence of India because they believe in such an influence as a benign legacy that permeates their lives without our having to be seen as seeking to impose it on them. The graceful retention of the name Singapore by its leaders after the British left was, as the journalist Sunando Datta Ray remarks, the best tribute Chinese Singapore could pay to India and her civilization. It came naturally as a measure of the goodwill and the repository of trust in a benign, non-threatening India built over centuries. The challenge facing countries who have soft power resources is how they can connect these to foreign policy goals, such as trade promotion and development, health security, or even more sensitive issues like counterterrorism or border disputes. We speak of yoga and Bollywood as potent sources of our soft power. Are these changing the way target countries think about or interact with India? Does the We On TV channel possess the image and acceptance among audiences across the world that CNN or the BBC or even CGTN or Russian television have? This prompts us to look at how Korean soft power is now the talk of the town. Korean pop bands are crowd catchers across the globe. Their government has now begun to focus more on leveraging this soft power resource for showcasing foreign policy related events. For instance, it arranged for a concert in Pyongyang for singers like Red are no exception. The Oxford English Dictionary recently noted that they were riding the crest of the Korean wave with 26 Korean words being added to the dictionary. The Hankook University of Foreign Studies and Big Hit Entertainment have jointly created a series of textbooks featuring the super hit pop band BTS for international fans to learn Korean. South Korean public diplomacy also uses Korean entertainment fan networks to deliver messages to engaged audiences. As a 2020 Carnegie Endowment report noted, creating opportunities for celebrities to use their own voices to speak for South Korean foreign policy priorities, such as inter-Korean detente, can be incredibly powerful. What is most interesting is how South Korea, a mid-sized power, unenviably surrounded by geopolitical titans like China, Russia, and Japan, with the United States completing the mix, has been able to use its soft power strengths to transcend neighborhood challenges and expand her influence on critical 
transnational issues. Despite the continued need for defense and deterrence capabilities that South Korea must not neglect because of the threats to her security, her soft power is enabling carve-outs that promote Korean interests in a number of transnational situations, with a growing premium being placed on South Korea's status as a robust democracy. Today, South Korea scores high in global soft power index rankings, which combine data in six areas, government, digital, culture, enterprise, engagement, and education, and polling data in seven, cuisine, tech products, friendliness, culture, luxury goods, foreign policy, and livability. Among countries in Asia, Japan tops the list, followed by South Korea, Singapore, and China. As the Carnegie Report also concludes, South Korea provides a new model of what a 21st century Asian country can look like, an advanced economy mixed with an ancient civilization that is at once irrevocably democratic, technologically innovative, and culturally vibrant. There are cues for India here. Across the world, we have 38 Indian cultural centers established by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, ICCR, that provides courses in various aspects of Indian culture yoga, dance, music, and language, and develop the outreach in these fields to local audiences and communities. Their numbers are not commensurate with India's size and weight on the global stage. We need far more such institutions spread over various regions. In the United States, which remains a key global influencer and where discerning audiences in the capital, Washington, D.C., would avidly flock to lectures, seminars, readings, exhibitions, and performances relating to India at an institution that is a veritable house of Indian culture, we are yet to establish a cultural center, notwithstanding the experience of many other countries who have demonstrated the reach of their soft power through similar centers which have operated there for decades. Let me add that this is not for want of sincere effort and lack of good intentions on the part of our authorities, but somehow the establishment of the center has eluded us and remains one of the gaps in our cultural outreach in the United States. The Indian diaspora in that country has sought to fill the gap admirably, but nothing can replace a cultural institution in a world capital like Washington that bears the insignia of India. I would also like to dwell briefly on a topic that often receives top billing in India, this being the comparisons between India and China. We see China as a competitor, an adversary with which we share an uneasy and where our contested borders are concerned, an armed coexistence. China's hard power, military, strategic, and economic, makes for a mix that overshadows the region today, eliciting fear, wariness, and cautionary responses to her outreach in the region. Despite this phenomenon, China scores higher on the Global Soft Power Index than India does. In the words of Kanti Bajpai, who has been based in Singapore over the last few years and is positioned from there to observe both India and China, classical India may stand head to head with classical China in the regard it garners, 
but contemporary India has been left a distance behind. Unquote. It is only if we recognize this that we can start to do something about it. Over the last few decades, China has consciously sought to soften its image abroad and receive respect using the appeal of Chinese art, architecture, cinema, literature, universities, and its behemoth economy. Several hundred Confucius Institutes have been established also in the furtherance of this aim. Even if all these efforts may not have entirely yielded the desired goals of China's charm offensive, because of the authoritarian nature of the Chinese state and its obsessive control of its citizenry, including gross violations of their human rights, the vast expenditures made on soft power diplomacy make for considerable impact. China's tourism industry is also far more well-established and successful than India's and the numbers of international tourists that China annually receives, around 63 million before the pandemic, far outnumber those who came to India, which was around 17 million annually when last counted. Our state capacity in terms of infrastructure, investment promotion, and monetary resources is much behind China's in this field. We need to tie higher levels of national ambition and driven foreign policy leadership to investment in soft power development. India's strengths vis-a-vis -vis China lie in her democratic credentials, her open society, and institutional freedoms and constitutional values that stress respect for diversity, pluralism, and the protection of minorities. She must leverage these soft power assets better. Global opinion about India is built on the latter's capacity to uphold these values and also the workings of internal governance. We must demonstrate to the world that our democracy, to use the words of Amitav Ghosh, is stubbornly open to the flow of opinions, stubbornly resistant to the floodwaters that seek to grind all forms of life into uniform grains of sand, that it creates an archipelago of hope for the rest of the world in what we are seeing as trying times. There are some areas in which India needs to invest more in ensuring the effectiveness of her soft power. The creation of Brand India and India promotion has to be couched in a millennial vocabulary in tune with the 21st century. There has to be a focus on social media platforms, radio and television, films and documentary production, the scale and spectacle of cultural performances, in other words, a more robust, demonstrative deployment of India's soft power. For instance, as the largest democracy in the world, India has no international television channel that represents the country in the world. The BBC, to cite an example, is Britain's best global advocate in the cosmopolis that defines the borderless space we inhabit today. We need an Indian voice that speaks an international idiom which makes the country more intelligible to the world. There is a predilection among those who inhabit the bureaucracy to follow the established precedent because it is a safe harbor and a risk aversion that we wear as default. As I have said before, big countries with real power aspirations must dare and do. A sophistication of presentation and the embrace of spectacle, the way the Chinese do, 
remember the 2008 Beijing Olympics, in our cultural outreach is a necessity. We must impress, appeal, and make the lasting statement. We also need many more hands on deck in our foreign office for public diplomacy maneuvers through the induction of PR professionals, as also augmented financial resources. Like Meiji era Japan, today's India must scour the whole wide world for new ideas and best practices in communication and image projection. We need what some have called extraversion, that orientation towards the real world, the ability to be assertive, receptive, well-grounded, and always communicative, the capacity to adapt, innovate, and embrace change should be a constant. One of the areas for focus in developing our soft power is aid and development diplomacy. The Ministry of External Affairs has, since 1964, administered the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program, or ITEC, as it is popularly known, involving education and training of students and young professionals from the developing countries, especially from Africa, Latin America, South and Southeast Asia. This is a program that has built enormous goodwill for India over the years and won the country numerous friends and well-wishers. The expansion of such programs should be a strategic necessity together with the Development Partnership Initiative of the Ministry of External Affairs as also the upgrading of our tertiary learning institutions to host more foreign students so that their numbers in our country increase. Here again, present numbers are no match for the students from abroad who flock to Chinese institutions of higher learning. Our neighborhood of South Asia is the primary focus of our foreign policy and therefore a natural environment into which our soft power extends. As an exercise in soft power, despite the strategic difficulties involved, India's outreach into Afghanistan from 2001 till the events of August this year when the Taliban regained their control over the country can be cited as an instance of gaining great goodwill and winning hearts and minds. Development assistance from India totaled over 3 billion US dollars in the 2001 to 2021 period and much more if calculated in purchasing power parity terms and involved projects that focused on health, education, including vocational education for Afghan women, capacity development and food security, among others. Additionally, India built roads and power transmission lines and dams. Indian small development projects benefiting those at the grassroots have extended into every province and district of Afghanistan. The parliament building in Kabul was also a gift from India. The impact on the Afghan people and on key influencers of public opinion was extremely positive and tremendous. This is an inspirational model of soft power at work that served foreign policy ends in an impactful manner. In the rest of South Asia, the picture is mixed. There is no doubt about the shared cultural universe of South Asia and the impact of Indian entertainment, music, dance, poetry and cuisine in the region spurred on by interactive historical experiences, shared ethnicities, linguistic and religious connectivity. But dissonances in political relationships, a low trust quotient, shortcomings in capacity and even missteps in Indian diplomacy over the decades, deficiencies in infrastructure linkages, trade and commercial interaction 
and the overall lack of regional integration make for an imperfectly imagined South Asia. Also, the very domination of India's geographical space is a factor that impinges on the mindsets of her smaller neighbors and erodes trust. It follows that Indian policymakers have to be constantly alert to these realities as they navigate the complex regional environment surrounding the country. The absence of a South Asian commons and the development of a shared South Asian consciousness is a direct offshoot also of the failure of SARC or the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, which has fallen victim to the continuing deep-rooted complexities and the wide chasms that engulf India-Pakistan relations, as also the growing tendency to focus on regions beyond the subcontinent as far as foreign policy initiatives are concerned. For instance, as SARC has receded into the shadows, India's Act East policy, which is oriented toward Southeast Asia and the ASEAN countries, or its Indo-Pacific focus, is more in the spotlight and has gained more traction. One need not object to either the Act East initiatives or those concerning the Indo-Pacific, but the shelving of the idea of South Asia, a region meant to be an integer, is unfortunate. What then is the power of soft power? It is true that powerful soft power draws its strength from the persuasive power of the creative talent, the civilizational ethos, the cultural matrix, the entertainment strengths, touristic attractions, rich cultural and historical heritage, the customs, the cuisine and the lifestyle, and natural beauty of a nation state. Yet, it cannot fulfill its aims unless the mirror that we hold up to the source country concerned displays a picture of a dynamic, progressive, democratic, equitable society that is a responsible stakeholder in world politics and a contributor to the global public good. Soft power is also just one constituent of the matrix that makes up a comprehensive national power defined as the mix of resources and influence that a country possesses, where power is defined as the capacity of a state to direct or influence the behavior of other states, non-state actors, and the course of international events. As Australia's Lowy Institute defines it in their reputed Asian Power Index, resources like economic and military capability, resilience and future potential, combined with measures of influence like cultural and diplomatic, defense networks and economic relationships together make up the power of a state. Our policymakers, experts and thinkers must work on a map for the future that plots all these points and charts routes and pathways to these destinations. Our soft power trajectory will blaze a far brighter trail if it is contextualized within the framework of these surrounding indices of power as the world sees them today. On a finishing note, we in India have to break free of our definitions of soft power as being centered solely in our civilizational ethos and cultural diversity. This has been our comfort zone and we need to get beyond it. We must ask ourselves why we are not on the cutting edge of soft power like Korea with K-pop, China with TikTok, or Japan with anime. We must ask ourselves why we have no international brands like Uniqlo or an Emirates airline or an Al Jazeera, or why we do not have a Jack Ma with name recognition across markets, 
or why we consciously sought to stifle a brand like Air India, which was second only to Singapore Airlines as a world-recognized airline 50 years ago, and which we are now struggling to revive? Is it because we are too insular, prisoners of ideas that have outlived their shelf lives, comfortable with the precedent and afraid of risk, and preferring our giant echo chamber? Is it because we lack a third eye of sharp observation and a keen listening ear? Why do we have a convoluted struggle with modernity, understanding it only superficially, foreign ideas and open markets, unlike the three East Asian countries just mentioned? Why is India not the IT superpower that develops killer apps, as Neil Ferguson called it not long ago? Is it because we do not dream big and boldly enough or turn our clocks forward so as to catch up for lost time? The answer literally blows in the wind. But let me switch modes now as we have dwelt enough on these issues. Let me end with a small offering to Krishna Bose. It is a song that blends East and West on a comfortable dialogue between the two, as all soft power must ensure. The song is from Rabindranath Tagore and the Bengali verses effortlessly merge into the words of Robert Burns, Purano She Dinir Kota and Old Lang Syne. Krishna Ji, I hope, is listening from where I know she must be. Thank you, Sugata and Sumantra. Thank you, ladies. Ladies and gentlemen, it just remains for me to warmly thank Nirupama Rao on your behalf uh, and ours
for giving such a splendid second Krishna Bose lecture. She has made a persuasive and convincing case for better marshalling of India's soft power resources, but she has also warned us that we will only be effective in doing so if we abide by our constitutional values and the protection of minority rights. Thank you, Nirupama, for delivering such a wide-ranging and brilliantly crafted lecture. I will not say more because I want you all to leave with the unforgettable memory of the music that she presented for Krishna Bose in conclusion. Purano Shei Biner Katha Bhulbi Kire Hai. To our global audience, goodbye and good night from Calcutta.